Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. Here on our YouTube channel, we do a weekly segment we call News Bites. Short bites of news about interesting things happening in space and astronomy this week. All right, and we've got some big news stories this week. So let's get into them. And the big news, of course, was the Event Horizon Telescope finally releases its image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. We have been waiting for this picture since 2017. And that's when the Event Horizon Telescope, this worldwide collaboration of telescopes across the entire Earth, from Greenland to Antarctica, from the North America to Europe, all captured two separate objects. The supermassive black hole at the middle of galaxy M87, which has 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun, and then the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, which has about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And so it turns out these two black holes, even though they're vastly different masses are also vastly different sizes, and they end up being roughly the same size in the sky. And so the perfect two objects for the event horizon telescope to image. And so the data was captured in 2017. And it was like a ton of data and they had to fly all the data back on airplanes from Antarctica from around the world, they had to transmit it over the internet. And then it took years for them to crunch the data. And in 2019, they released the first image of m87, the big one. And we were all kind of surprised because we were expecting the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, Sag A star, and not M87. And then it's been many years, it's been like four more years, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting to finally see this image of Sag A star. And today, we see it. And so what are we looking at? Well, I mean, it's obviously very familiar. It's a orangish red blurry blob with a hole in the middle, similar to the one that we saw with M87. We were expecting it to be maybe in line with the rotation of the Milky Way. But the surprise is we're seeing face on on this black hole and its accretion disk. And and that's unexpected. The object is also not quite as crisp because it's so much closer and it's so much smaller and a lot more dynamic. And so you've got material swirling around the black hole in almost real time. And it was very difficult to then take the you know, they needed the additional years to crunch the data down to get this final image. Now, it's kind of amazing to see this black hole potentially consuming material and the astronomers gave a really interesting analogy that if you were to go on the supermassive black holes diet, you would eat the equivalent of one grain of rice every million years. And so people always think that black holes are like voracious monsters eating everything around them. But actually, most of the time they're barely feeding at all, unless they're actively consuming stars and such. And it's, you know, looks like a donut. How big? is this object in the sky. And this is the part that's kind of amazing because they had to build a telescope the size of planet Earth to image it. And so if you took a donut, and you put it on the moon, and then you took a picture of it, that's the size in the sky that this thing is. It's absolutely incredible, a phenomenal feat of science and engineering. And we will be studying this image for years to come. China is building its own version of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, last week, we talked about China's space exploration plans uh, with an asteroid redirect mission. This week, we heard their plans that they're building a space telescope. The telescope is called Shuntian. And what it's going to be is a two meter space telescope that will be observing in roughly the same wavelengths as the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's a little smaller than Hubble. It's going to be in near infrared, visible and ultraviolet. And the plan is that this space telescope is going to have the way its optics are going to be set up, it's going to have a 350 times wider field of view than Hubble. So instead of focusing in on very specific objects, this is going to do wider surveys kind of like, say, Vera Rubin Observatory compared to something that's a more narrow focus telescope, you can get these wide survey images that will allow you to see a lot of stuff all at the same time. And the goal is to be able to map out things like dark matter, dark energy, try to understand some of the more complicated 
big unknowns in astronomy. And what was really kind of cool about this idea, originally, they would thought, well, we'll attach it to the space stations, the Chinese have their own space station, and they were going to attach this new space telescope to the space station. But they decided that wasn't a great idea. Obviously, space stations can shake and rattle and there's heat transmission, all kinds of problems. So instead, it's going to fly in formation with the space station and the space station is going to have a special docking bay. And so then whenever they want to do any upgrades or any repairs, they'll bring this space telescope back to the space station, they'll be able to go out, swap out instruments, be able to make sure that all of its gyros are working, and then release it again, and it'll be able to go and continue doing its work, which I think is a really clever, very elegant idea. Imagine if the Hubble Space Telescope could fly near the International Space Station and dock for repairs and upgrades, and then go back out again, it would probably really help it out. But you know, it went to space before the space station. So in this case, the the teamwork makes sense. Russia says it's going to be leaving the International Space Station. Well, in Russia says a lot of stuff that doesn't happen. We, we got this news this week. This was from Dmitry Rogozin, who is the head of the Russian Space Agency, that the decision has already been made that Russia is probably going to be leaving the International Space Station. That said, Russia said a lot of stuff like and not just about the International Space Station during the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They've been talking about plans in the past that they were going to abandon the space station that they were going to end their commitment to the space station. They've talked about missions they are going to be sending to Mars to the moon to Venus, uh, new rocket platforms that they say that they're building. Like, we don't really report what Russia says without fact checking and and making absolutely certain that these things are, are in place. I'm just, you know, we've learned our lesson as space reporters. Now, that said, they also said that they are going to fulfill their commitments, they're going to give their international partners a year's notice before they actually do leave the space station. So who knows if and when this is going to happen. And at the same time, officials from NASA said, so far, the working arrangement with Russia has been perfectly professional, you know, the actual engineers, mission controllers at the Russian Space Agency are doing their job, they're fulfilling their commitments, everything is cordial professional. So will they leave? We don't know. I, you know, like, I would say, who knows? Who cares? We'll just wait for them to give the final yes, we're leaving. And then NASA and his partners will have to figure out what to do at that point. But right now, it's a lot of saber rattling politics. So just kind of ignore it. So we've almost reached a 1000 patrons. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, everyone knows we're in a race head to head race with SpaceX and NASA to reach for us to reach a 1000 patrons for them to go to space, it looks like we're winning. Um, but still, we're we'd still have more people join us and become patrons. And of course, the price is that I will be starting up the book club here on the universe today channel. Again, we don't really know what form this is going to take. But I'd love to hear your ideas. I'd love to hear your book suggestions when we get this started. So uh, but definitely come become a patron. When we hit a 1000, we'll start up the book club. Also, we do a really fun community discussion every Wednesday on our discord server, where you get to talk in real time with me and Anton and other members of the community. It's a fairly small group. So if you want to get a chance to just hang out and talk about topics in space and astronomy, come and join the discord server. Another test of spin launch. All right, so this week, we saw a really cool video that came out of the spin launch system. And this was them testing another payload. This went on April 22nd, 2022. They launched another payload, spun it up to high speed. They launched it out of their centrifuge at 1600 kilometers per hour. And it went up to an altitude of several kilometers. And what was really cool about this test was they put a camera on the payload. And so you got to see as it flew out from the centrifuge and was flying up in the air and you could see the centrifuge getting smaller and smaller in the background. Now this is just a scaled down prototype of spin launch. They're planning a bigger version that will eventually be able to spin payloads up to about 8000 kilometers per hour, which will save about 70% of the propellant costs and launch requirements for a traditional rocket launch. So lots of more tests, but they have a potential contract with NASA to be able to to actually do this. And so we'll keep watching these tests as they get closer and closer to a full scale version. Insight detects another Mars quake, a big one. 
NASA's Mars InSight lander has been sitting on the surface of Mars very quietly listening to the interior of Mars. And so far, the spacecraft has detected 1300 Mars quakes, you know, earthquakes, but on Mars, um, a few crossed the four magnitude range. And this week, they announced that they found the biggest one seen so far, fifth magnitude. Now I live in earthquake country here in Western Canada, I've been in fifth magnitude earthquakes. And that's when they start to get a little unnerving, you feel them, the, the house starts to shake, you can definitely feel a fifth magnitude earthquake. Now this was across the planet from Mars Insight it was able to detect the seismic waves as they moved through Mars. And this is the key that the more of these Mars quakes that Mars Insight is able to detect, it allows it to map out the inside of Mars, where are all the different layers, where's its crust, where's its internal core, and how cool is the inside of the planet. So more quakes, the better. Ingenuity solar panels are starting to darken. We've been watching with kind of amazement at how NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter has been flying around the Perseverance rover. They were only planning to send this out five times. That was going to be the duration of the mission. We're now well into the 20s. And as we've seen with all of the vehicles, all of the solar powered vehicles that go to Mars, the dust is a big problem. It falls onto the solar panels and sticks there. And I'm sure you're like, why don't they just have a brush? Why don't they just blow it off? Well, the stuff is electrostatically charged. And so it actually sticks, it clings to the solar panels. And this is what in the end, took out spirit and opportunity, they got covered, they couldn't keep themselves warm, and they died. And now I mean, this is a problem for the insight lander as well. Although they've got a pretty clever solution to get rid of the dust on insight, they scooped soil onto the solar panels and let it slide off and pull some of the dust off. With ingenuity, once again, you're getting this dust starting to accumulate onto the top of the helicopter. And its power levels had gotten so low that it went offline and wasn't able to communicate with perseverance. And so perseverance stopped shut down all of its communication systems waited for the helicopter to regain some kind of communication. And they didn't hear anything for about a day. And then they did, they got another message. And so the helicopter is still there. But like prepare yourself for the end. We're heading into the wintertime in Mars, where the the rover and the helicopter are solar panels are starting to get darkened, it's gonna be harder and harder for it to stay warm for it to be able to survive the cold Martian winters. We might be seeing the last few flights of this helicopter. But still, the success of ingenuity has gone so far above the expectations of, of anyone that it now just seems like you'd be crazy not to put one of these helicopters on board every single mission that goes to Mars it's been that successful to be able to have this scout that flies ahead that maps out the terrain in three dimensions and provides real time information back to the rover is critical. And you can imagine future Martian explorers bringing these kinds of helicopters with them as well to map out the terrain around them. So even if it dies tomorrow, it's been an incredible success. The first lunar eclipse of 2022 is on Sunday night. Hopefully you're watching this video before Sunday, May 15th. That is when South America, most of North America and parts of Europe are going to be able to see a total lunar eclipse. This is of course, where the shadow of the Earth falls on the moon, darkening it. And then at the point of the highest eclipse, the moon turns this crazy red color. And unfortunately, for me in Western Canada, we're going to be able to see the eclipse part way, we're not gonna be able to see the full eclipse. But if you live anywhere in South America, anywhere across sort of the middle of North America to the East Coast, and into Europe, you're going to be able to see a much better view. We've got an incredible guide on universe today that covers all the places all of the times all the details the tips to observe it. So come check that out, find out for your location when you're going to be able to see the eclipse, and then go out there and watch it. Lunar eclipses are are so great. They're safe to watch with your eyes. 
they unfold over a long period of time, you can see these changes as the moon is being gobbled up by the shadow of the Earth. They're quite exciting. I really like lunar eclipses. So don't miss it if you can. Starliner is set for May 19th for another launch attempt. How will NASA send humans to the International Space Station after the loss of the space shuttle? Well, the plan was that they were going to have two separate human rated vehicles, you're going to have the SpaceX Crew Dragon, and you're going to have the Boeing CST 100 Starliner. SpaceX went through all of the requirements went through all of the tests was able to do uncrewed test and eventually was able to send humans up to the space station. Starliner went through a bunch of problems and has still yet to complete a successful test to fly from the ground to dock with the International Space Station and fulfill that part of the requirements. But after their last set of flight issues, they've addressed what they believe to be all of the problems. And now they're going to do another attempt on May 19th. And the goal here is again, to launch to dock with the International Space Station, and to confirm that they can perform all of these parts of the of the mission. And if that works, then maybe in the future, we'll be able to see humans start to go to fly on board the, the Boeing Starliner. Now there's one advantage that Starliner has that that the Crew Dragon doesn't have. And that is that it has the ability to help reboost the International Space Station. And this is of course a problem if the deals with Russia starts to fall apart, Russia is no longer launching its progress cargo vessels to this space station, it's going to be Starliner that will have the capability to boost the station. There's, there's other plans to be able to do this as well. But but really, a lot of the hope is placed in Starliner. So, you know, I mean, obviously, it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> that Starliner hasn't flown to this point, And a lot of money has been spent on it. But it is good. I think it's really important to have two separate vehicle systems that can both do this job redundancy makes a ton of sense in this modern age. So I think, hopefully, they'll they've worked through all their issues and the spacecraft will launch. But don't be surprised if it doesn't don't be surprised if there's more delays. That is something we should all be prepared for. And we also got a really cool video of the dream chaser being built. This is another cargo vessel that's being developed to deliver to the International Space Station. So you can see this picture in their assembly bay of how the spacecraft is coming together and how far along they are. And hopefully within the next couple of years, Dream Chaser will be able to act as a cargo vessel to the International Space Station. And maybe even after that, it could end up carrying passengers both to the International Space Station and maybe to other independent commercial space tourism space stations. So stay tuned. But it's great to see that this is still taking shape as well. All right, that's all the news that we have this week. But we had some really cool interviews this week that I wanted to talk to you about. First, uh, we talked to Dr. Edward Balaban about building liquid mirrors in space, like actually just how liquid can act as a lens and could support building like 50 meter space telescopes, far more simply than traditional space telescopes, it'll, it'll blow another one of those interviews that'll blow your mind. I talked to Dr. Kevin Cannon from the Colorado School of Mines about lunar regolith and how we will be able to deal with this fairly dangerous powder that gets into everything, wears and tears machinery, gets into people's lungs. How can we deal with it? And even how can we use it to gather for resources on the moon? And the last interview that I had this week was with Dr. Chris Impey from University of Arizona. And we talked about the idea of sending messages out to aliens, essentially alerting the aliens of our presence here on Earth. Is it ethical? Should we do it? How would we do it? We cover all of that in this interview. It's fascinating. Of course, this is just a fraction of the space news that we're covering on universe today. And you can get all of it by signing up to my weekly email newsletter goes out to 50,000 people has no ads, I write every word in the newsletter, and you can sign up, just go to universe today.com slash newsletter. And if you don't want to watch stuff as video, you can get everything that we do as a podcast, just go to universe today.com slash podcast, or go to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And you can subscribe to our podcast as well. Consider joining our Patreon. With your support, we can keep the ads at a minimum, you get an ad free version of universe today for life, even if you unsubscribe. 
So thanks everyone who's already subscribed. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, the galaxy wanderers, and everyone who subscribed to all of our other tiers. Your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news this week. I'll see you next week.